Good morning. Well, you turn your Bibles with me to the book of 1 Corinthians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 will be there in, in just a moment or two. It is certainly great to see each of you here this morning. We have several folks visiting with us. We want you to know that you are our honored guest and we are very thankful that you have decided to worship our God with us this morning here at Hickory Knoll. There may be some visitors just passing through, others that may be living close by and are looking for a church home and we want you to know that that we love you and here at the Hickory Knoll Church of Christ we strive to be Christ-centered and Bible based. We have several of our own folks who are traveling out of town, many in Florence, Alabama, for the annual fundraising event for Heritage Christian University, and most of those folks will be late back later this evening. Our lesson this morning is called Teaching the Inspired Words of God. Of course, for the last few weeks and for the next couple of weeks, we are, are focusing in on this idea of being in in our number. And we're focusing on the value of the Bible school program here at Hickory Knoll. I, I know it's been announced several times and it'll be announced again today that at 5 o'clock this evening there is a teacher's meeting. It's designed for all current teachers and anyone who would like to teach in the future as well. We are inviting you to come and to learn about being a part of our Bible school program and teaching our young folks and our older folks as well. With all of that in mind, we're talking this morning about the inspired word of God. Notice what scripture says in 1 Corinthians chapter 2 as we see some of the things this morning that the Bible claims about what it is and, and who it represents. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2 verse number 7, the apostle Paul says, but we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the ages of our glory, which none of the rulers of this age knew, for had they known, they would not have crucified and let there be light. And there was. Okay, sorry. And... For they had known that they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. Verse number 9, But as it is written, I has not seen nor has heard, nor have entered into the heart of man, the things which God has prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us, through His Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. We notice, first of all, this morning that the Bible claims to be a revelation given by the Spirit of God. God has revealed Himself in several ways throughout history. He's revealed Himself through creation, through the prophets, and through Jesus, and, and of course through His written Word. God, I suppose, in a sense, all was a mystery at the very beginning, as this passage describes. But he is not a complete mystery now. Now, there are some things that we still do not fully understand or comprehend about God. And as a result, we have faith in him and we worship him, knowing that he is God and knowing that we are not. But he has revealed to us many great things that help us to understand who he is and who we are to be as his creation and as his children. We are able, through the word of God, to learn about these deep things of God and to learn about how we are to prepare our lives, as Brother Ben prayed this morning, for that prepared place called heaven. Secondly, as we go over to the book of 2 Timothy 3, will you turn your Bibles with me there, to 2 Timothy chapter 3, 
verse number 16 and 17. Now, the first verse of this passage is over here on the left-hand side. But in Scripture as well, in 2 Timothy 3, verse 16, the Bible says all Scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. Not only does the Bible claim to be the revealed Word of God, but it also claims to be the inspired Word of God. This idea of inspiration, the idea literally out of the verse meaning God breathe. And so with this written Word of God, the Bible, as we know it today, this is God breathing and inspiring, moving these men to record those things that are of eternity, those things that are of God. One fellow wrote that inspiration is the inbreathing of God into men, enabling them to receive and communicate divine truth without error. You see, because the Word of God is inspired, it contains divine truth without no error, without any mistakes, without any contradictions. Because God's Word is inspired, because He has breathed upon it His thoughts to these men, we can trust that this is not just a, a word from a man, but this is the word from the man of God, the Son of God, Jesus Christ, and God the Father as well. Third, will you turn your Bibles with me over to the book of First Peter chapter 4. And we learn more about what the Bible does claim. In First Peter chapter 4, verse number 11, the Apostle Peter, being inspired by the Holy Spirit, says, If anyone speaks, let him speak as the oracles of God. If anyone ministers, let him do with the ability which God supplies, that in all things God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To whom belong the glory and the dominion forever and ever. Also in the book of Second Peter, in chapter number 1, Beginning in verse number 19, Peter continues this idea about the Word of God. And he says, We also have the prophetic word made more sure, which you do well to heed as a light that shines in a dark place, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts, knowing this first, that no scripture or prophecy of scripture is of any private interpretation. For prophecy never came by the will of man, but holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. The Bible claims to be authoritative. It is the Word of God. It's not a word from man, but it is the Word from God. And these men were not simply making things up to fill up Scripture or to fill up pages or to, to fill up scrolls. But these men were explaining and recording the authoritative Word of God, the oracles of God that will result in us understanding the wisdom of God. And forth, over in the book of Jude, verse number 3. Jude only has one chapter. So verse number 3 in the book of Jude. Beloved, Jude writes, for I was very diligent to write to you concerning our common salvation. I found it necessary to write to you, exhorting you to contend earnestly for the faith 
which was once for all delivered to the saints. The Bible claims to be a revelation from God, an inspired revelation from God with authority and forth its completion. The Bible claims that this is the complete final revelation word of God. In other words, we do not need anything more or anything less than God's word. There's a lot of traditions, there's a lot of ideas, a lot of man-made thinking pertaining to what we should be and who we should be. However, Jude reminds us that we are to contend for the faith That was once for all delivered to the saints. There is no continuing process of God's word being written after this first century, after this New Testament. Rather, this is the complete word of God. Aren't you thankful that God (coughs) has decided to reveal himself to us through his word? His inspired word, his authoritative word, his complete word of God. The Bible teaches us in many ways. It teaches us by commands. It teaches us by examples, by inferences, by principles, (coughs) and by silence. And as we learn to study God's word will come to better appreciate the differences between the Old and New Testament, who each book was written to, why it was written, and what purpose it has for us. But God's Word is truth. And we are to do several things with the truth. Will you turn your Bible with me to the Gospel of John, chapter number 17? John chapter 17. These are the words of Jesus. Very simply in John 17, verse 17. Verse 17 the Bible says, Jesus speaking, Sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. And so as men and women of God, as Bible students and Bible teachers, we have the opportunity to teach this truth of God. But before we teach the truth, there are a few items that we need to focus in on. Turn your Bibles to 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. As we are learning and appreciating this morning what the Word of God says about what this Word, this revealed Word, has the opportunity to do in our lives. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse number 10, the Bible says, And with all unrighteous deception... Among those who perish, because they did not receive the love of the truth, that they might be saved. So as we have this truth of God, as revealed to us by His written Word, we are to love the truth. Look in verse number 12, that they all may be condemned who did not believe the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. We want to love the truth. We want to believe the truth. And as we notice earlier in 1 Peter chapter 1 verse number 22, we want to obey the truth as well. But finally this morning, will you turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 4 as we're trying to bring this in for a landing and to bring all of these items together and to draw a point or two of application. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 15, the Apostle Paul 
says that, but we are to speak the truth in love, that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, who is Christ. Now I realize that most of the time as we look at this passage of speaking about the, speaking the truth in love, we're probably often thinking about what we do as in preaching and to communicate that truth in love. Or we may be thinking about folks that may disagree with what Scripture says and we want to communicate that truth in love. But we're looking very specifically at this verse this morning. With our teachers in mind, we are to teach or to speak the truth in love so that we may grow up in all things into him who is the head, Christ. A couple of days ago, I had sent out a a question to several of our current and past Bible school teachers. And the question was very simple. Why do you teach at Hickory Knoll? Brandy says, I love teaching for two reasons. It helps me to continue to learn about the Bible. And I get to know all of our sweet kids. Thomas says that there are two reasons that he teaches. Number one, to increase his knowledge and understanding. And number two, to increase the knowledge and foundation of those in the class. He continues to say, for my kids being in Bible class on a regular basis is important because they continue to build their foundation. They may not remember who told them or how they know something. It's the consistent information and the reinforcement that allows them to put the puzzle together. Pat Sue says, because I love the kids, because I love God's word and want to try and pass it on, because I want someone to teach my kids so that I need to be willing to do my part, because it is fun. Most of the time, and we appreciate that honesty. Dusty says that Acts commands us to do so. I teach at Hickory Knoll because teaching our youth about the Bible will help them to draw application and live their lives according to the Word. Also, teaching our young gives them the biblical knowledge to teach others. Gina says, for many reasons, I believe one of the many gifts God has given me is the ability to teach. It blesses me with greater knowledge of whatever subject I teach and relationships with people. It's challenging, rewarding, and a great privilege to be a part of someone's life. Mary says that there's some quick answers, obligation, shortage of those willing to do so, so that our children will be knowledgeable of Bible characters and lessons. Also, I believe we are commanded to teach others, and this includes our own. And if we don't educate, what future will the church have? Kay Davis says uh, a few reasons. It's never too early to begin to teach God's Word. The biblical example of Jesus teaching the children. The joy I had received when the babies first say Bible and pat it softly. It makes me feel more a part of the church family and brings me closer to fellow Christians that I might not otherwise interact with. Dot says that she loves teaching children about the Bible. Before Hickory Knoll, I had always taught preschool, but lately I've taught first, second, and third grade. They seem very excited, and that makes preparing the lessons very rewarding. Lorraine says, when I used to teach, it was a feeling that I was doing something for the Lord, also helping the little ones grow in His Word. I am willing and ready to help out anybody because I needed to feel helpful to the Lord and to grow in His Word. 
Jana says, I know this may sound cheesy, <laughs> but I was born and raised in the congregation. I was super blessed to have had amazing Bible school teachers, and she has amazing in all caps. Loretta Starr, Jean Key, Sarah Laguna, Jim Keaton, my mom, and many others. My first teaching experience was assisting Miss Chapman with the twos and threes. And I think and I know that I was in that class as a, a two-year-old. Laura Kaiser says, I enjoy it. Kids are great and so much fun. There is joy in watching the kids learn things for the first time. It's exciting to see them remember something you taught them many weeks and months ago. I learn a lot from the Bible myself when I teach. I like to think that I had some sort of small part in their decision to become a Christian when they are older. I see how much my kids love Bible class. So I am glad to bring enjoyment to someone else's child as well. I'll have more to say from more from others later on in another sermon. But for the time being, we are focusing in on teaching the truth in love. Teaching the inspired word of God to children and adults. I know very well what it's like to be a teacher, obviously, and to prepare lessons. I've taught, of course, in adults, but I've taught many times for children and teenagers as well. And I know what it's like to, to go through those lesson plans and, and to read what the objective is and to see what the activities are and, and to look at all the things that need to be done to teach that lesson. And we are very thankful that we have organized curriculum. By the way, if you're thinking about teaching and, and you say, well, I don't know enough, well, we're going to give you the curriculum and we just need you to, to go in and, and to, to teach those lesson plans. But here's the thing. What we need to be reminded of and hopefully be encouraged about this morning is that when we teach it's not just teaching curriculum. It's not just teaching a lesson plan. But we are teaching the inspired Word of God to children and to adults. It's God-breathed learning. It is wisdom that has been revealed from God the Father, the creator of this world. It is inspired. It is the complete revelation of God. And as teachers, we get the opportunity to impart and to share what God has spoken to us. I don't know about you, but the opportunity to share with someone else the Word of God, the living, God-breathed, inspired Word of God should encourage us and to motivate us and to also have appreciation for all of those who have taught us the Word of God and hopefully encourage and motivate us to begin teaching others the Word of God. As we close this morning, we encourage each and every one of you to think and rethink your involvement in sharing and teaching the inspired Word of God to others. We have a song of invitation that has been selected this morning, and we would love for you to be a Christian. If you would like for us to teach the Bible and to sit down and study Scripture with you, we would love to do that. But if you are ready this morning to become a Christian by believing in Jesus Christ as the Son of God, by repenting of your sins, and by confessing your faith and being baptized into Christ, having all of your sins washed away. If you're ready this morning to become a Christian, will you come forward right now while together we stand and sing?